Well, thank you all. Oh, welcome to the first Vermont Vegetable and Berry Growers webinar of the 2024 year. Got a great lineup today for winter, tu winter tunnel growing, lessons learned. Hoping to hear from folks what's worked and what hasn't. Got some great growers lined up. Unfortunately, Krista, who was um, speaking, had a bunch of damage from the storm last night and no power. So I have some notes and slides from her and I can share those at the end if we have some empty space, but I really wanted to honor the folks who are able to come and thank you all for persevering. Um, and just reminders, keep yourself muted. If you have a question, you can throw it in the chat or we'll have time to talk a few minutes after each speaker and then hopefully time at the end. So I am going to hand it over to James. I'll stop sharing now and you can pop your slides. Up. And thank you so, so much farmers for sharing. And while we're waiting, if anybody who's attending wants to just put in um, their name and where they're from, if they have any like topics of interest they would like covered in this webinar, you can pop that into the chat as well. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I'm uh, James Dunnigan from Trillium Hill Farm in Hinesburg. So um, we are about an acre and a half of outdoor growing and then about a third of an acre of hoop houses. All the hoop houses are single, single layer poly, all unheated. Um, this is a picture of four of our larger ones, the 30 by 72s. Um, these are some of our smaller ones, the 21s, 21 by 68s and the 17 by 68s. I guess I'll just uh, go through a few pictures uh, to give you an idea of the crops that we're growing. And then I've got a few spreadsheets um, with a few more of the details of planting dates and varieties. Um, so this is an early November picture we got some lettuce some tokyo bacana yakina savoy mizuna and arugula uh we have one of the larger houses um left side is all well, i guess i should say uh this year all of our all of our winter crops all of our hoop house uh, greens were paper pot transplanted um and we did that to get uh, fuller stands, um, had some you know in problems with inconsistent germination, direct seeded, but also to get um, you know one to three more weeks out of the summer crops. Um, so left side is multi seeded lettuce, and then right side is salanovas, and you can see some of the uh, varieties <clears throat> up there. This this picture is mid November spinach. Uh, the varieties that we've been doing are Space Calibri and Renegade, and experiment a little bit, but most pretty much exclusively we do single leaf harvest. So you know, cutting off the big large outer leaves, and we you know we get a significant number of harvests. I don't know if we get six or eight harvests per plant. Do some kale. Uh, in this house, there's also uh, on the far left side some carrots and a hidden bed of mosh. And this house is five beds of Claytonia on the left, one Minutina, and then two Frizee. Uh, the Claytonia has been a really uh, significant part of our winter greens mix. The Minutina um, is also part of the... We tend to do a uh, Claytonia lettuce minutina mix whenever we can and the frizzy is an experiment a friend um, who has a farm in the hudson valley told me that it was a major part of their salad mix in march so that's a, a trial and then uh, we, we got some cress and sorrel the sorrel will be spring harvest cress we harvested um, some uh, december and I think we'll get a, another harvest or two. Here's a, a later picture of the lettuce before we we got started harvesting it. Probably probably the first of December. This is the mix I was talking talking about: um, Claytonia, Minutina, red lettuce. Uh, here's a couple of our issues. On the left, we have uh, Alba Rosa and I think Alba Rosa and red oak lettuce uh, with I believe down in downy mildew 
And then a significant problem, if, if we're not planning for it, can be the Claytonia weeds. <clears throat> um, this year, well, last year, we had a ton of Claytonia weeds in our spinach, which um, I felt like was a, a problem. Um, so we tried to switch up the rotation to have the Claytonia weeds in with the lettuce, thinking that they're going to go into the mix anyway, so um, it wouldn't wouldn't be an issue. And then uh, on the right picture on the right is a disease on Claytonia. It's something I'm just seeing a little more of. I don't I'm not familiar with what it is, uh, but hope to look into that. I don't know if anybody knows about Claytonia diseases, but uh, this is something we've been doing for a while. Uh, the overwintered onions. Uh, very happy to, to be harvesting uh, full-size green onions at the end of Mar uh, May and 1st of June. Um, but, you know, we plant that, put them in at the end of September. And it's a lot of, t they're in there a lot, a lot of time. Uh, so we've been interplanting with lettuce. And I guess one, one, uh, we, we, we switched up the timing a little bit. It used to be, we would get the, we would stagger the lettuce planting so that we would get the harvest in April. Um, then the onion harvest in end of May and first of June. But I felt like maybe that the lettuce was interfering with the onion growth. So I, I pushed it a little bit back. And so we'd harvested that lettuce a couple of weeks ago and we were seeing some, I believe, downy mildew on the onions. So I'm a little concerned about that. And we may, depending on how, how the onion growth goes in this spring, we may discontinue this interplanting. So I'm going to switch over to a spreadsheet to share a little more of the dates and varieties. Uh, so here's, I just by date, what we did for hoop house plantings. So I don't know um, if I should just scroll down through here or read it out. Anybody have a suggestion? James, that's really kind and generous of you to share the dates. Um, I think maybe I could, if you're willing, we could just like kind of summarize it and I could send it back out to folks when it's, when we're done. But if people have things they want him to slow down on right now, you could just um, holler or if you see anything that's really interesting. Sounds good. Uh, yeah. I've got it also by crop. So I, that's by day. I've got it organized by crop. And oh, cool. this will give you a little bit of an idea of when, when I'm harvesting that. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, if you could, are you willing to take those now as you're scrolling around? Yes, that sounds good. Um, so first, Kari asked if Cress is direct sown. So everything was paper potted. Um, let's see. Go back to, okay, I guess I'll go to Cress. Right up here. Let's see, more info. Cress, I'd, I'd use the uh, two-inch paper pots, a uh, couple seeds per, per cell. Awesome. Great. Wow, that's impressive. That's a lot of paper potting. Um, also, Emily was wondering if the photos you showed were pretty much all in November, except the ones where you said it was December. Uh, I think so. Yeah. Cool. And then Heather would like to know more about Claytonia. Uh, what, how many cuts you get, percent you're putting in your salad mix, how the yield is. See, uh, this will give you an idea of the yields to date. So, Claytonia. So, my beds are about 200 square feet each. And to date, we've gotten uh, about approximately, you know, a little less than 60 pounds per bed. And usually we get like, I would say, well, you know, th this winter, last winter has been quite mild. Um, so we're working on our second or third harvest per bed on the Claytonia right now. And we will, nor normally we would get several more harvests in <clears throat> end of February, March, in March. So, so far the Claytonia 
the yield is the same as the Salanova, but the Salanova is all done. I haven't found it to last through the winter, but the Claytonia we should get, you know, at least that much again in the spring, if not more. That's um, great. Yeah, cool. like, I, like I said, the Claytonia can be a very significant weed problem. Um, if, if a weed problem in the winter is a problem for you. Seems better than chickweed, but who am I to say? <laughs> Another question, and this might be something we want to talk more about at the end after everyone has spoken, but Dan is wondering about recommendations for rhizoctonia issues in tunnels, spring, late fall, and winter. Does planting on plastic or fabric completely solve the issue? And I know, actually, James, we talked about this yesterday in our um, soils group. And um, I would just say that some growers are trying plastic fairly successfully. Also, mustard biofumigation is something that one of the growers is trying. And James, I know you were curious about some of those practices as well, right? Yeah, I haven't done anything uh, for that. Is uh, Would you say that's the disease that I had on the lettuce picture? I would think so, yeah. Yep. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely, Dan, I think you're not alone in, in managing with this. And maybe some of the other growers will talk about this, but there's some varietal differences, some horticultural kind of management differences as well that seem to mitigate it, but it's still hard. It's a tough one. James, do you have other things to share or should we move on? No, I, th I think um, that's what I had intended to share. It's awesome. Your farm is so beautiful. And um, those pictures are not just uh, the best of. That's kind of how it always looks. So thank you so much for sharing and very generously offering so much information. Well, it is the best of, but um, <laughs> <laughs> the best pictures I've had. <laughs> cool. Well, I'm going to um, hop over. Uh, I'm going to share my screen again. And Sayer is... Uh, really kind to share after like kind of a harrowing trip home last night. Um, thank you for being here. And Sarah is a farmer in New Hampshire, but has worked a bunch in Vermont. And um, we met recently at the High Tunnel Conference. And I know you've got a wealth of experience with growing. So thank you for sharing. And you can just um, tell me when you want to advance your slides and go for it. Thanks, Becky. Um, so I'm from Open Woods Farm in Grafton, New Hampshire, and this is a very small, um, small farm. I'm growing outdoors on half an acre, and then I have two tunnels that I'm growing in currently. One is this one pictured, which is um, 30 by 76, and then I have one farmer's friend tunnel that is 14 by 100. So right now I'm growing in two tunnels. Um, I got a American Farmland Trust grant. So I have another tunnel that is put up, but not in time to grow in this winter. So I'll be growing in that one in the spring. And my NRCS funding just went through on a fourth tunnel. So <laughs> next winter I'll go to four tunnels, which is going to be kind of a big jump. Um, but that's kind of exciting. So you can go forward now, Becky. Okay, so varieties. Um, I grow a lot of spinach just because it does so well in the winter. My favorite, well, I'm selecting for downy mildew resistance and ease of harvesting is really important for me because I'm doing single leaf harvests. Um, right now, Oroch is my favorite. It's the one pictured in both of the top photos. Um, it's got a really nice spade sheep shaped leaf that gets pretty large. Um, and it's got a really upright growth habit, which I appreciate in harvesting. Um, another variety I really like is Colibri. It's slightly more savoyed, um, but it's still got a pretty large leaf with upright growth. And I'm having really good success with Sun Angel. Um, that is much more savoyed than Colibri, but it doesn't curl over in the same way that Hammerhead does. Um, I'm not growing Hammerhead anymore because of it just being kind of more challenging to harvest. Space has been okay for me. Um, I haven't really seen much um, downy mildew this year, but if there is some, it's on the space. And I also feel like space sort of grows closer to the ground and it's harder for me to harvest cleanly. 
Um, you can go forward, Becky. So lettuce varieties, um, I'm doing all Salanova and one cut for my lettuce mixes. Um, I just feel like they're pretty hearty um, and they're sturdy lettuce and they weigh a lot, which is great. Um, for Salanova, I'm doing the butterhead varieties, the sweet crisps, the incised, the batavias. And then I've added in some one cuts from Johnny's. Um, I'm really into intercut and frizzigo. Frizzigo, especially it's the one in the photo on the left that looks like it's going to kind of crawl out of the picture. Um, and then I'm not doing head lettuce anymore. I feel like it's too unpredictable whether I'm going to make it to December with um, nice looking head lettuce. It's in the ground for a really long time, which is hard for me in a small space. And so for head lettuce, I'm sticking um, segalane and rosane. I've never actually heard anyone say those names. I don't know if I'm pronouncing segalane correctly, but um, you can see on the bottom that is segalane and then on the right, those are all of the, uh, the kale varieties I'm doing are dark ybor and mamba. Um, they're just basic um, consistent kale varieties that I like. I'm not doing any reds. I feel like I haven't had very good luck um, getting reds through the winter um, at this point. You can go forward. Um, this slide shows other things that I'm getting in the tunnels in the winter. Um, I'm doing radishes, carrots, chard, scallions, and green garlic. Most of these photos are just showing you the intercropping that I'm doing because I'm only growing in two tunnels and I'm trying to maximize um, yields as much as possible. So on the top left, that's radishes planted with carrots. I think I did two rows of radishes and three rows of carrots. Um, the bottom left is charred with carrots, two rows of charred, three rows of carrots. Um, top right is two rows of two rows of kale with uh, scallions. And then the bottom, um, so what I do is I harvest the radishes. And after I'm done harvesting radishes, I plant garlic. And this is green garlic coming up in the spring that is then planted with um, lira and choy. Uh, so I'm not going to go down this list of dates. And if you want specific dates, I'm really happy to share my air table. Um, you're welcome to reach out. Um, every year I keep a lot of records on what's working and what's not working so that I can make adjustments next year. Um, I definitely don't have it perfectly figured out and I'm always changing things. Um, for example, this year I tried two carrot successions, um, each a week apart, direct seeded. And I think in the future, I'm just going to do the earlier carrot succession, but I'll plant twice as many carrots. They hold in the ground so well, it doesn't really seem to make sense for me to do successions. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, I'm probably going to try to go earlier on kale and chard, um, so that they're a little bit bigger when I start harvesting in late October and November. And I'm still playing around with how late I can push radishes. This year, I direct seeded on 8-21, um, and they were ready while I was still harvesting from the field, um, which was unfortunate. So next year, it'll be a little bit later. I'll see how late I can go. Um, okay, Becky, you can switch. And then the real thing for dates for me um, is I don't harvest in January, February, and March. Um, I'm trying to get through the end of farmer's market, which ends in the beginning of October through the Christmas holiday. Um, and then I sort of just let everything go in January. I have completely unheated tunnels. There's no, no heat at all. Um, I do online sales from October to December. So everything is um, harvested to order, which is really nice when you're growing winter. Sign up starts in January, so I have an income stream. And so do early spring growing. <clears throat> um, so I have a CSA that starts the first or second week of April, depending on weather. So this allows me time to flip beds. Um, I'm not overwintering anything. And I start transplanting paper pot stuff um, basically March 1st in the tunnels. Um, so I like to have that space between January and, and the 1st of March to sort of prepare everything. Uh, okay, some of the things that are hard for me, um, row cover is challenging, as I'm sure it is for everybody. Um, 
I have a full-time employee in the main season, but I don't in the winter. Um, so it's just me mostly managing row cover. Um, it never gets removed exactly at the right time because I also have a kid and other things that I'm doing. Um, and so some of the issues I have are like powder, powdery mildew and lettuce. Um, some of my solutions that I figured out is I use pieces that are manageable for one person to move. I feel like if I always had someone helping me, I would use a piece that was almost the full size of the hoop house. But um, right now I'm almost doing, I'm doing like one or two rows at a time. Um, I have sandbags as a stand-in for another person. So each end, I'm always pulling against the sandbag. I'm not just pulling against the loose piece of row cover. Um, and I stick to a pretty strict routine of which bed I start with and which bed I finish with. It just makes it easier. And I hope that somebody someday does Wi-Fi automated row cover because that would make it a lot easier. I've had some vol issues in the past, so I'm pretty much on top of it now. Um, it just took a lot of proactive management. Um, I start, I trap whether I see bowls or not, but I'm constantly scouting for damage. You can see some um, some kale that's been girdled on the, on the right there. Um, I scout for holes a lot and then I over trap, which means I just put like, I don't know, there's six traps on that one hole. Um, and I always flag trap, flag the holes so that I remember where they are. Um, and I check traps and set traps um, every couple of days. Okay. Um, this one is a big one for me. I can talk about this more uh, at another time, <laughs> but um, I've had about three years of really bad cutworms um, in all seasons, but um, in the winter, it's been the winter cutworms. Um, they've destroyed entire plantings of chard, spinach, germinating carrots, and Asian greens. Um, I've tried everything. I've worked with um, Anna Wallingford at UNH. Um, I know a lot about cutworms. <laughs> Any questions, but I'm not going to talk about all of those things right now. Um, what has worked is I received funding from NRCS for exclusion netting to keep the moths out. Um, and this is a 55% woven shade cloth. Um, it paid for the shade cloth. It paid for fans for added ventilation. And my farm is off grid. So it also covered um, solar and battery to keep the fans running. Um, uh, this is my first winter after a season with um, woven shade cloth. And it seems to be making a difference. But I've also found seduce spinosad bait to be really effective. They're like tiny little cutworm treats. Um, and it's awesome. You find dead cutworms all over the place. All right, next slide. And then um, I mentioned I was off grid. So winter harvesting, washing, and storage can be really hard for, for me. Um, there aren't any farm roads because it's a small space and it's also my home. So things that have helped me are having a flexible harvest schedule. I'm constantly watching the weather. If I have a market on Monday, I'd love to harvest on Sunday, but I might have to harvest on Friday. Um, I use a lot of ice fishing sleds, which you can see in the bottom right corner. Um, Miranda, my employee, is pulling. I'm making sure things don't fall out. My dog Poplar's helping. Um, I did move my wash pack station from an open air shed that I use in the summer into my wood heated prop house. Um, and that's just made my hands less freezing, basically. And then um, my walk-in cooler is outside. It's not in a heated space. Um, so if it's cold enough, I can actually store stuff in a vegetable area in my basement. Um, or I can also just put a pot of hot water in the cooler overnight, and that that has helped a lot. That's been fine. Um, as I expand, I may look into doing some sort of um, mild propane heater thing, but I'm not sure yet. Um, and then te temperature sensors have been important for me. Um, I use sensor push sensors with Wi-Fi so I can check them when I'm gone. And this is Poplar um, helping me through harvest on a soggy day. And that's it. Thanks so much, Slayer. That's um, your hardcore. <laughs> that looks beautiful. <laughs> um, couple questions here. How do you do irrigation in the winter? Um, I don't or do you? I don't. Um, I usually irrigate until about the first of November, um, and then I don't really irrigate again until March. Um, 
if it's still frozen in March, I just, I have a hose that's drained and I drag it out and hook it up to the irrigation in the tunnels. And Kari was wondering if you transplant your spinach and if so, how many seeds per cell you are using? Yeah, the only things I'm direct seeding are radishes um, and carrots, I think, and spinach. Um, I'm doing one seed per cell and four inch paper pots. And that's for winter. I think in the summer, I'm switching it up a little bit in the summer. I'll be doing maybe I'll do two inch spacing and a couple seeds per cell. <clears throat> cool. And do you have a date when you plant the green garlic? Or sorry, when do you plant the green garlic for what harvest date? I don't really have a set date. I sort of squeeze it in as I can. So right now I'm I'm doing it behind radishes. So I'll harvest all the radishes in the tunnel and then I'll put garlic in. It's warmer in the tunnel. It seems to come up um, pretty well. Um, it's, it's coming up right now. And um, I'm usually harvesting it uh late april early may for my spring csa cool and vic wants to know um what you're baiting your vole traps with um i this honest answer is i obviously i honestly don't really bait them off <laughs> i usually just put a ton around a hole and they come up and go right into the traps. Um, if I am baiting, I do sometimes use peanut butter. I haven't gotten more creative than that. If anyone has any other suggestions. They might not be the smartest rodents. So it sounds like you're. Yeah, I think they're like not. Yeah. Can they see very well? I don't know. <laughs> I think so. um, yeah, that was a kind of a gory picture. And then how did the carrot char? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> How did the carrot chard combo go and how do you time the seeding and planting? It was great. Um, I can't remember. <laughs> I have to look at my calendar. Um, I think, I can't remember if I seeded the carrots first or planted the chard first, but everything was so small that it was easy to get the jang in and do three rows between between the chard. Um, but I'm happy to look that up if anyone wants to know. I'm happy to share my my spreadsheets. Awesome. Thank you. So generous of you to um, share and especially after a kind of a crazy storm and day before. So thank you. Thanks, Becky. Yeah. Andy, you're up. Do you want to share your screen? Okay. Um, thanks, everybody. So great to hear about things we should be doing. Um, always really appreciate that. Um, so, uh, I'm Andy Jones from Intervale Community Farm in Burlington, Vermont. Um, we, um, are located on the floodplain of the Winooski River, uh, right in the Burlington city limits. So we have, um, a pretty favorable microclimate for considering, uh, what Vermont is. We're sort of in, in one of the, one of the banana belts for the state. Um, just some quick Quick stats about the business, um, 22 acres or so of field veg, all certified organic. We have about a half an acre or so of tunnels uh, that we use throughout the year. 90% um, of our revenue is uh, is the our, our summer and our winter CSA. So that's really our business. We're actually a, a, a consumer. The farm is a consumer co-op, uh, sort of like your local food co-ops that many of you sell to. Um, owned by uh, our CSA members. So um, that's really been the focus of ours in the last 35 years. We do about 18,000 square feet of winter greens for CSA. Uh, a tiny bit of that is for wholesale. Um, our winter share runs from beginning of November through the end of April and into, into May a smidge. Um, so we are really, our, our aim is um, to really have those greens throughout the winter. Um, the, the greens that are coming out of our tunnels um, constitute about a third of the value of our winter share. Um, some are, you know, 50,000, 55, depending on uh, 60, depending on how good the year is uh, in total, in total value. Um, they're definitely, 
a top crop uh, in terms of our CSA member preferences. Um, and they are one of the reasons they're sort of a hook uh, to get and keep people uh, in our winter CSA. So it allows us to sell a lot of root vegetables and winter squash and cabbage. There are a lot of people who, who like those crops and would be happy to have almost entirely those. There are also many people who uh, those things aren't enough. Um, so they really want to have something, uh, something fresh and green on a regular basis. And certainly all of us farming uh, really appreciate that. So at the end of the day, our production goal is to have reasonable quantities of nice greens um, on our CSA tables all winter long. So we, uh, we distribute every week. Um, so we're really looking for something to be there for, uh, for the entire winter. Um, these are the crops that we're growing, um, uh, kind of uh, in rough order of, of, of uh, importance from the upper left to the, to the lower, lower right. Um, baby lettuce and spinach are, are the sort of the biggest, uh, the biggest two by area and by importance, followed by kale, some herbs, uh, baby bok choy, and, and, and so on down the way. For us, it's really nice to have diversity. So it's really, we, we, we love to have more than, you know, more than one of these things each week. Um, it's also the case that in our particular location, um, we often don't really need anything or much out of the tunnels um, for a good portion of the fall. So we'll have a lot of, uh, a lot of kale, a lot of spinach, uh, Brussels sprouts uh, coming out of the field, and a lot of that stuff uh, we can the kale in particular, but also Swiss chard and spinach and things like that. Um, we can often pick into you know later November, sometimes into December, out of the field, and then keep it in the walk-in and whatnot. So our production window, we have some things that were some of our tunnel crops that were we're picking in uh, November and December, but really. What we're focused on is trying to have uh, crops in January, February, March, and April. Um, so just going through uh, some of the crops individually, um, I guess I should say a word about our uh, about our our tunnels first. We have four uh, identical uh, tunnels uh, from Harnwa Industries. Uh, we put these up in 2012. We've been really happy with them. Uh, they're 32 feet wide. Uh, which allows us to have six five-foot beds with a, a smidge more on the outer edge, which is handy when we're trying to bring the tractor and prep them. Um, and uh, they are 132 feet long, which is just a function of our function of our site. So it's really nice. Uh, while our crop rotation isn't isn't as 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 nice, and there, we don't have a lot of time off uh, for crops. It is nice that we have four modular spaces that it's really easy to sort of plan rotations around moving things around. Um, during the winter months, these are filled with greens. And during the summer months, we have uh, tomatoes and cucumbers in these tunnels. We do have one tunnel that we're not using peak summer. Um, and it's really worked out well for us to have a, an empty tunnel in the summer um particularly in the late fall or, i mean in the uh in the late summer and early fall because that allows us to make sure that those first plantings that really have to get in on time um our first things like herbs and uh and our curly kale and things like that um don't have any conflicts with summer crops that are that are continuing to grow um, the transition period from summer to winter and then from winter to summer is always one of the big uh one of the big farm scrambles um, baby lettuce, uh, it's about a third of our winter tunnel uh, tunnel action. Um, this is sort of a typical kind of mid-December, mid later December uh, look here. Um, the, we use uh, electrical, 10-foot sections of electrical conduit as a, as a hoop. Uh, we have row covers that we can pull over when necessary. Um, we like to hang the row covers up or really keep them off the ground when we're not, when we have them off the crop for more than uh, a couple of days, um, in addition to keeping the covers kind of drier and not shading the plants that when they're tucked down and right in a, in a, uh, in a walking path, 
it also allows us to prevent some of the vole damage. We used to have voles kind of like hole up in these long bundles of cozy row cover. Um, and so these are just little remay hoops uh, with a little leg bent onto them that tuck up into a, a bracket that's on the, the harnois uh, at the hip board there. Um, so yeah, we do about a third of our areas in baby lettuce. Uh, we do basically four varieties, green sweet, Eztron, which is an easy leaf, uh, red in size, red sweet. Um, they, they each have their strengths and weaknesses. We like to have, we like to have something that, um, has, you know, more than one leaf look. Um, they're still fairly similar. It's not a super fancy mix, uh, but it is productive. And these are the varieties that we've learned can keep going through the whole winter, uh, which is important to us. It's not that every planting goes through the whole winter, but over the course of our successions that allows us to, to cut lettuce uh, most of the winter. Um, these are all transplanted on a six by six sp spacing, mostly by hand. We do use a paper pot some. We've kind of moved away from it a little bit the last couple of years. We just get more consistent stand establishment. We have very sandy soil and sometimes it's hard to get the seed bed firm enough to get a good paper pot experience. Um, and all the transplants are, are approximately four weeks old when they go in uh, or all the lettuce transplants, second through fourth weeks of October. Uh, we do three different plantings uh, and they kind of go in second week, third week, fourth week. Our typical harvest begin kind of early December and then we'll get two to three cuts, uh, depending on the season and depending on which planting it was. Certainly, the later plantings we don't uh, we don't tend to get as much out of. Um, and we used to do a bunch of earlier plantings, but they haven't. Re they never really. Uh, it was already too soon when we still had stuff coming out of the field. Um, we tend to row cover this stuff at, in sort of the the mid twenties. Uh, overnight. The tunnels are all unheated. They are double poly, uh, but the rope, the air temperature inside the tunnel tends to be about the same as the as the outside air most of the time. Spinach, um, our other major crop, uh, again, about a third of our area, a third of the total value. Um, downy mildew resistance is critical for us. We've had significant outbreaks that have taken down houses and beds and stuff in the past. Um, we've been recent in the last couple of years growing Sun Angel and Colibri, um, as Sayer has. Um, they they they're both good spinach, reasonably upright. Um, uh, Sun Angel is a little better for us, but I really am nervous about having only one variety, um, just in case there's something you know that we're not anticipating. Um, we tend to have a little bit more cladosporium problems in the Colibri than we do in the Sun Angel later in the season. Our spinach is mostly direct seeded. We do one round of transplants. Um, we found that the direct seeded stuff is just more productive over the life of the planting, even though the transplanted uh, the transplanted stuff can be ready sooner. So um, we have timing wise, there's one planting where it makes sense for us to do some uh, do some transplants and we do those in paper pots, four inches in the row, two seeds per cell about four inches, four, four to five inches between the, the lines. Um, and otherwise we're direct seeding around 35 seeds a foot, uh, 12 rows or so of the bed. Harvesting starts um, in early December, um, sometimes later. We love to push it later when we can um, and we don't need the spinach, um, but a lot of years we're into it in December. And overall over the course of the uh, over the course of the year, we tend to get two to three cuts per planting. We are primarily cutting, uh, mostly by hand with knives. Occasionally we'll use the quick cut greens harvesters, but they don't work, they haven't worked super well for us when we want to get a quality second or third cut. Um, and our spinach is almost never covered. Um, if, if we're going to have, if we have harvestable spinach, it's going to be zero or negative temperatures in the tunnels. Um, then we might think about covering, but we're rarely planning to cover our spinach. Other things, green curly kale is important. Um, that's another 12% of our area. 
Uh, we grow winter boar. Things go in at about a 12 by 14 spacing, kind of staggered in the bed. Um, we used to fill in here with other kale and cut out half the plants uh, in the fall, but it turned out that that was happening. That needed to happen on a time of year when we were really busy with other things. So we just wouldn't always get to it in a timely fashion and they'd be tangled in with the other plants that we wanted to leave behind. And so we've kind of sugared off to just planting them farther apart, even though for the first month, it feels painful at how much empty space there is, but it's working for us. Um, we start picking, we have to do an October pick. We've learned, even though we don't need kale in October because we have a ton in the field, if we don't pick it in October, then stuff gets grown together and tangled up in a way that it just doesn't grow well later in the uh, later in the winter. So we do an October pick and then we'll start sort of re-picking um, around now or so uh, as it's as it's resized up. And kale we don't cover until it's quite a bit colder, 17 or 18 kind of overnights. Baby bok choy is another crop that we like a lot. It's really only good in December for us, maybe into January, but it doesn't stand the cold. The leaf petioles get mushy. Um, so we do a couple of beds of that. Um, it's a really nice fresh crop. It grows really well. Uh, we grow only one May Queen Choi. We transplant all of it about the same week. It's on our six by six spacing, multi rows per bed over here. Um, and uh, because it's out of there so early in the season, we often will follow it. Usually we'll follow it up with arugula, sometimes just other things, baby, baby kale or something else. It's a little, it, depending on the stage of harvest, um, it, uh, this is actually wrong, I guess. We really cover that at more like a, a 24 to 25 degree. It just doesn't, uh, doesn't hack the cold as well. Parsley and cilantro have become important for us in the last couple of years. Um, it's really nice, a, a small amount of area. You can get a lot of repicks. It's more labor intensive because we're bunching, um, but we can kind of pick it all winter long, starting November and and on through until um, on through until uh, uh, until spring. Uh, the cilantro is a little less hardy. Um, we tend to cover this stuff 23, 22 degrees. Uh, but we'll get a lot of bunches uh, out of the bed, out of the, the couple of beds that we grow each year. Um, the uh, seven by 10 spacing seems to work out well for us. And we'll fill in in between with some, uh, some of the uh, cilantro plants between the parsley, sort of in a staggered, staggered planting window there. And then sort of our minor crops, baby red Russian kale. Um, it, it's a great thing because it's versatile. People at a small size can use it as a salad or mix it into a salad, um, but it's also easy to cook with. Once it gets a little bigger, which this is not a great picture, but it's sort of in here, it's growing up and a little rangier. This is a kind of a, a, a mid, mid, mid spring, late winter look. Um, and it's got a lot of nice edible stem um, as well as leaf surface. And you can get, if the timing is right for, and the growth is good and uniform, um, we can really get a lot of tonnage off of that um, in uh, particularly on the second cuts, even more, even more than the first. So, and arugula and radish are primarily succession crops for us, um, you know, following the bok choy, or if we have a section of lettuce or something that, uh, that dies out or a, a spinach, a spinach bed that, uh, we pull out for downy mildew, um, then we'll we'll fill that in later. Uh, I want to talk briefly about insects and diseases. Um, you know, certainly on the insect side of things, aphids are the big insect of concern for us. Part of it, I think, has to do with that we're coming out of uh, crops, tomatoes and cucumbers, where we often have some at least low level aphids. So getting those into um, you know, get it, get it, get it, getting the, uh, keeping the aphids out of the following greens are a little challenging. If it's warm enough, we will release beneficials in the fall if we have aphids. Um, but a lot like lace wings or the, uh, aphelinas, but they don't really work in cool temperatures. So once we get to later October, November, it's really ladybugs or nothing. Um, as far as beneficials. And we do like a small number, like a handful, you know, quarter cup kind of thing of ladybugs 
each week we get a gallon, we keep them in the walk-in all winter and kind of gradually, uh, gradually meter them out. They are, as others have pointed out, the one insect that your members don't really mind, your customers don't mind finding in their food. Um, with caterpillars, cutworms, they can be an issue for us. Um, we'll usually use BT sprays for those and get good enough control. Um, if we have to spray aphids, we try to alternate those with the beneficials. Um, and those are, you know, things like insecticidal soaps, pyrethrum, grandiva, we try to rotate through. So we're not using anything specifically uh, too often. Uh, downy mildew is definitely our biggest disease problem. Um, resistant cultivator, cultivars and ventilation are the, are the key for that. Um, and they're also important for us for cladosporium, which can be a problem for us in, in uh, spinach, particularly with a colibri. But um, mostly that's a manageable thing until kind of later in the winter. Depends a lot on the particular temperatures that we, that we see. Um, in lettuce, Rhizoctonia crown rot is really the biggest trouble where you get plant collapse. We've learned that if we plant too early and it's too warm for a while while the lettuce is establishing, we have much higher incidence of that. To some degree, the fall weather, I mean, the fall weather is always out of our control, but as we've planted somewhat later um, into October instead of later September, we've definitely had better, uh, we've avoided more of the, of the rhizoc uh, and those kind of collapses. So the summary, um, for us, the things that have really made things work, our market uh, is very flexible. Um, so we can do different things um, as people are interested. Um, most of our harvests uh, we're aiming for after the field greens and it took us a while to learn that timing for that. Um, so for us, mid-September to early November are the planting windows. If we plant too early or too late, it doesn't work out as well for us. The varieties have really mattered for us. Um, having a lot of ventilation and ventilating frequently uh, has been important. Keeping the idle covers off of the plants and hung up has been really helpful. Um, doing a fair amount of scouting and, and controlling early, whether that's insect releases or spraying. We have some small houses, 14 footers. The larger houses are much better. Um, they just are a much more consistent temperature. And starting our harvest early enough, especially once we get into the time with a lot of daylight um, is really key to making things work out for us. So that's it. Amazing. Thanks, Sandy. Um, it's a wealth of information and some exciting things to think about. We have uh, just under 10 minutes for uh, questions. If people want to unmute and ask questions, I will, um, I'll read from the chat, but feel free to pop in uh, if you'd like to, to speak as well, I'm going to start with a question for Emily and she's asking all the people who presented or all growers wondering about the transition of a greenhouse from heat loving summer crops like tomatoes into fall planted crops for winter harvest. We have unheated greenhouses, but we're surprised this year with the very er mild early fall and how long our tomatoes went. When do you say enough versus capitalizing on a later crop of tomatoes? Or I'm happy to talk about that for a second. <laughs> um, yeah, I just think my situation is a little bit unique because I'm working with two tunnels right now. And so I my transition from the high value summer crops into winter greens um, has to happen based on dates and much less on whether my tomatoes are still going or not. And the way I justify that to myself is that I need some sort of income from October to January. And so if I don't just say enough on the tomatoes and get those winter greens in, then I don't have, I can't, I don't have a harvest at the right time and I won't have money when I need it. Um, so it's much more of a financial situation looking at those off months for me. Um, and I'm also planning my crop rotations row by row instead of house by house which can get a little bit complicated, but that's sort of how I figured out how to maximize profits. So if I have a house um, full of tomatoes, my cherry tomatoes are still cranking, but my slicers aren't looking great. I'm gonna pull out just one row of slicers and put in one row of lettuce. Um, so there's a little bit more uh, rotation management in there, but it's worked really well for me. 
That's a great point. And I think James touched on it too, talking about leaning on transplants more. Like it's, um, yeah. that gives you like that little bit of lag to anyone else. I think the flip is always a challenge, you know, and I think we have a calendar and if we don't stick to the calendar, we get in trouble, you know, and economically, I think if we had no, if we didn't have sort of the winter CSA market that we really were aiming for things at a specific time for greens, it's hard to argue with the economics of leaving the tomato crop in the ground. You know, if we were all just going to wholesale it, and we had a big, big, uh, uh, a big opportunity to do that in the winter because you know it's like oh yeah you pick a, a couple hundred pounds of tomatoes and that's you know 500 bucks or something and it didn't really take that much time and to get that much of greens is there's a lot more effort until the tomatoes are really done done that's a good point that's kind of the situation we find ourselves in at my farm a lot it's like a lot easier to look at the stuff that's there and sell it than to <laughs> flip it um Andy, do you have any special vole issues and what do you do? Uh, the voles are really the biggest problem in the bok choy. So we expect them, we pre-trap similar to Sayre. We we use snap traps inside of like a, a 15 inch section of four inch PVC sort of scattered throughout the bed. And then if we see some activity, we'll kind of cluster a bunch of traps around there. They sometimes bother other things, but... Um, but not too much. We have some feral cats and foxes that that um, that uh, staff the perimeter of the tunnels too, which I think helps a lot. I like the fox. Fox staffing is exciting. Scott is wondering again about water. I think this comes up a lot. Um, if you have to water during the winter, and um, how you would manage it for freezing after the fact. I guess I would say my, um, my like kind of what I see is like a need to water when you're establishing. And then once like we're past that Persephone period in February is when the watering demand picks back up again. So using like a frost-free day to do that. Uh, Andy, you were about to say something. I definitely do some watering throughout the winter. Um, I do have some frost-free hydrants in some of the houses and then a different site that where there is not no buried water lines so just capitalizing on the days when i can do it making that a priority uh, and it you know seems especially needed you know when march comes around uh occasionally yeah frost free head rent definitely we it's it's a pain but we put some in a number of years ago and it's it's been totally worth it um we end up probably watering like every three to four weeks in the winter. And then, yeah, once we get into spring during establishment in the fall, it's pretty frequent. And then once we get into the kind of March area, um, we're watering quite a bit and we'll just, yeah, some of it we do by hand with, with a hose, some with drips, some with sprinklers. Uh, we just made sure to drain things in between because we will definitely have things freeze up in our tunnels. The air will freeze in our tunnels all the time through the winter. Thank you guys. I'm realizing it's just a minute before one. We've got another question from Bruce, but I'm just, if people have to peel off, um, I just want to thank the speakers so much. This The recording we will post in a couple of days on um, Vernal. It'll be on the, the veg page and I'll send a link out through the email. And if you're not a VVBGA member, this is um, sponsored by the VVBGA. So please consider joining. There's lots of great resources. And um, I think that's it. We've got a great next whole series of webinars. Next week is new tools and tricks. We've got a bunch of folks sharing some innovations and it'll be a good conversation. So please join again next Wednesday. And if people are willing to stay on, Bruce's last question is, how do James and Andy, how do you evaluate when to terminate the plantings for transition to spring or summer crops? And how hard do you push the spinach for an extra cutting? Typically, I harvest the spinach until it bolts, uh, unless my spring spinach is providing more than I need. Um, and yeah, you know, if I've got tomatoes or cucumbers that need to go in, then it the the overwinter crop comes out and put those in yeah for us it's mostly driven by the the, the schedule for those you know because those greenhouse transplants they've gotten going the tomatoes have gotten going in 
in uh, in March and the cukes are, you know, late later April. And so it's like, oh, we got to be able to put those things in the ground. So, uh, you know, we, we have to make that have to make that happen. So sorry, I was trying to share my last slide. I realized they had the next webinars up there. So um, this is the next three that are coming up. And thank you guys so much. I think we can um, wrap up. And if people have further questions, they can um, email me and I can ask the presenters. So thanks, everyone.